Without further interruptions, I'm delighted to present David Duncan. He'll be talking about building elastic configurations. Thank you, David, and I will get out of your way. Well, thanks, Rich. This is uh, super exciting for me to be here and uh, super, super happy to be a part of this, uh, the CentOS community and, and, um, and to get an opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what I've been working on for uh, quite a while now and something that I'm really proud of uh, being a part of the CentOS uh, process. So I'm David Duncan. I'm a partner solutions architect at Amazon uh, Web Services, and I, um, I am uh, one of many people who works on lots of projects that are related to our operating system partners um, and uh, specialize in the Linux and the Unix space. Um, but I spend most of my time uh, working on uh, solutions that are uh, related to the uh, community around uh, Red Hat, Fedora, and CentOS. Um, so hibernation. Uh, this is an interesting topic to have around uh, both uh, traditionally a server operating system environment and also um, a, sort of a, a standard um, a cloud model, right? And uh, people don't necessarily think of this as a place where you'd use hibernate. They think of that really more of a place where, uh, you know, that's a that's more of a thing for your laptop, or uh, might be some sort of uh, combination of things. And it's an old technology, dates back to two thousand four. Um, so it's a little bit of a surprise that uh, that people are are looking at it. But in two thousand eighteen, um, we had a lot of, of customer feedback at Amazon. Um, is uh, uh, w and they wanted to be able to to leverage uh, a fast model for um, uh, restarting instances and making them available, um, and we did that in the context of uh, spot instances because that was a, a place where we had a two minute warning and uh, changes in price and people would want to. Um, stop a traditional workload instead of just having like a fail only architecture uh, around Elastic MapReduce or something like that, where they were taking advantage of spot instances, they wanted to do that with a more traditional uh, workload. And um, in 2020, there was a, uh, we extended that out to just the standard instances. And that's kind of where this story starts um, for me. Um, I mean, I've been working on, on Hibernate uh, and Hibernation support for, uh, for the, um, for, from Fedora up, to, up through to CentOS for a while now. Um, so we had lots of customers who wanted to do things like testing. They wanted to uh, have a faster access to instances. They wanted an event-driven model for um, starting and stopping those those instances, and they didn't want any kind of loss of continuity. Um, so, Michelle, we don't. I'm, I'm going to answer Michelle's question just very quickly. We don't solve the secure boot issue because uh, we don't use secure boot. We use a signed S3 snapshot, and I'll show you where that lives. Um, and uh, that's uh, that's how we've that's how we've handled it to date. Um, so let's look at that. Um, what's happening on the EC2, the, this instance, you know, is an instance is a virtual machine. That virtual machine has access to some, some of those virtual, <laughs> uh, virtual machines um, uh, will have access to ephemeral disks or instance stores that are, that are available for, um, uh, for use on a, on an in, on a consistent basis while the instance is uh, is alive, but once you hibernate it, though, you will lose access to those. And then there's the Amazon Elastic Block Storage volume that's associated with the root FS. So if you look at instance A, you can see that there's a root FS uh, only, and then in instance B, you'll see that there's uh, both a root FS volume and then also a secondary volume. Both of those volumes are associated with a snapshot. Those snapshots are contained in S3 buckets. And the S3 snapshot has a, um, has a CRC check that's associated with it and validated um, before the instance is started. So a, a machine image 
so to, to further answer your question, Michelle, about the secure boot, um, for an instance, the instance has to, the metadata uh, has to match for the machine image to be valid. And then for the machine image to start on the instance, all of that has, ha has, already, has already been done. And there's no, um, there's no place to tamper with that without changing the actual machine image identifiers. Um, so the volume is the only persistent component here. And now we're talking about Hibernate. So I'm, uh, one, root, the root volume is the only one that's defined typically in, um, in a standard instance. And two, uh, the volume itself is the only thing that's really persi persistent from start to stop. All your hardware changes uh, identifiers, right? Because those are randomly generated when you, uh, when you create the instance. And, and a lot of that uh, detail uh, is is not there. So so if you're leveraging swap, right, you'd, you'd have to know exactly how much swap space you needed, put that into the machine image, that machine image would be uh, idempotent, right? So so you would you would have a single configuration that could be used with a single instance type, uh, because you you need that swap file, uh, the swap in for the swap partition to um, to match the deployment every time. So, uh, so we looked at this and thought you're going to have to have a swap file on the instance root FS. And guess what's not supported in an enterprise Linux server? A swap file. Um, so we knew that we were going to need to uh, work with um, work with the Red Hat team and uh, and the surrounding teams, Fedora team, in fact, uh, to make sure that we were we were um, reinforcing how important this was to the life cycle of an instance and how important it was to the hibernation process for, um, for the EC2 instances that we wanted people to be able to use. And specifically, want, I wanted to be able to use those uh, in the enterprise Linux space. So this is kind of the vision, right? Um, uh, from the spot instance perspective, there, you know, there's, a, there's an adjustment in price. We're looking at standard instances right now. So, so the, uh, the spot instance itself, um, I, I have a little bit more information on, but, but so let's say we want to, we just want to make a, a definition for an instance. We want to get that into a, a specific configuration. And then we want to have our interruption behavior defined as we see fit. So if I want to have a fail only architecture, I can use a terminate. If I want to um, just, just uh, cease to compute for a specific workload, I can stop and restart that workload. Um, but if I want to have a little faster recovery time or I have, you know, I have a, let's say I have a very large, a fairly large instance type and I don't want to enumerate all the memory, it, you know, um, that I have to do boot up or make any of the modifications that I would expect to have to do with a, a new instance or, or a, a new workload. Uh, I just want it to come up and start doing what it was doing. Then the hibernation is a great, a great way to do that. And you can do that in the context of a number of things. So here's, here's the challenges that I, that we started to see, right? So, um, so this deviates from it, the standard server support model that everyone has under, has started, has understood around, uh, the space, right? So instances don't hibernate until now, and now they do. <laughs> so, uh, and we needed to extend that to make sure that it was available to everyone. Um, the, the driver is available on GitHub and, and or the agent, I'm sorry, the agent is available on GitHub. So we wanted to make sure that that was included. Um, we also wanted to make sure that, you know, we addressed these very specific OS level problems like the swap file and the fact that a swap file was not supported. There were some good reasons for not supporting it. And so, you know, we had to organize the way that this, this uh, uh, came together. And none of this was really consolidated into a singular problem space, obviously, because this was all new. So we organized, kind of started to organize around what needed to be done and uh, started to work with people in the community uh, who were, who thought, you know, who were important in the space, uh, because obviously this is not something, you know, you don't just, you don't just hand it over. Um, as as ready to go when there are a lot of things to concern and uh, are a lot of things at stake and a lot of things um, that concern um, the full stack 
Um, in fact, the SE Linux support was a very interesting one because we had to make it. We had to make some decisions. We'll go into that later. Uh, there were some corruption issues on XFS, which which was the default false file system for all these images that were being created. And obviously, we couldn't go back and make a decision that we were going to change the uh, the file system uh, as a result, and didn't really know if that was going to really make a, a huge difference. And then the agent itself. Uh, so uh, hibernation as a process required some uh, modifications to the way the ACPI functioned or uh, received alerts, and so we needed to we needed to make sure that those changes were were um, reasonable and handled in a way that was distribution friendly. Um, and then that needs to be continuously test, tested because uh, we're, uh, we want it to continue to work. So let's start off with the first one, the swap file. Um, it didn't, so, so I was looking at this from two perspectives. One was uh, the community support from Fedora all the way out to CentOS. And that means that in the middle there, I'm looking, I'm, I'm gain, gaining, uh, uh, my perspective was that we needed to make uh, the component parts for which the team that was building the software um, uh, were supported in the operating system and they could be used, they could be leveraged and we could, we could have um, uh, some, some supporting configuration changes. So we started with the SE Linux. Um, SE Linux support for the swap file, and there's a couple of bugs down here at the bottom of my slides, and I'll, I'll make these available in, in, uh, um, uh, for everybody. I'll, I'll work with Rich on that. And, um, and we, we put a lot of effort into looking at how this had to be done. Uh, there was a Fedora bug that was associated with someone else who wanted to do hibernation with a swap file. And so we kind of piggybacked off of that process and then collected together some, some customer information and, and figured out a way to, to identify exactly what the value was for, um, for the operating system and then collaborated um, with rel engineers who were responsible for making that, um, those changes. So that involved a huge number of people who were really amazing, um, uh, like Simo um, and, uh, um, See who else was involved in this. Dim, uh, Dimitri uh, was actually part of looking into this. So we had a lot of people on the Red Hat side who were who were helping us to to see where this was going, and and so we started looking at how that was going to work. But it turned out that um, on the Fedora side, there was a kind of a conversation around how would they how we would handle this, and and uh, because this was the swap file was being written to at the time of the shutdown it was this was being handled by system d and uh there was a question about just relaxing the, the policy around writing to the swap file that didn't seem right we really needed to create a way for um the system d to write to the swap file consistently with um with the se linux uh permissions preserved uh for um for, you know, to prevent writes from any other location or any other users. Um, so this dirty shutdown uh, actually ended up creating a, a problem that we couldn't easily, um, we couldn't easily uh, diagnose because you can't get to the, this, you know, a, a, a splash screen that tells you it's time to, to reboot or to, uh, to F, F suck your, your file system because you're you're stuck uh, waiting for that um, that to happen without a console. Um, so uh, we were detaching volumes, looking at the you know inspecting the the results, then running the file system checks and bringing those volumes back up to identify that we we'd gotten into the you know to to uh, show that it was still valid or viable. So we worked with. Um, uh, so this was really fun. Um, we worked with uh, the David Chenner's team and the XFS, and the XFS team at Red Hat, uh, talking back and forth about what was going on, and and um, and then uh, it 
it was such a fun kind of patch, right? Once once we realized what was going on and this, that this was actually not related to anything that was cloud at all, it happened to be uh, related directly to the NVMe device and how uh, how the communication to the swap file or the swap device at all uh, was was handled. And um, so I just thought this was a great quote um, from the patch that resulted from this, the effectively two line patch that uh, that that change this, you know, that fix this problem is why do you think it's taken us three years to discover this? And, and this is, this is the result of us, you know, having a collaborative experience where engineers from, from one, one team are collaborating with engineers from another team. And then they look down and they're like, this is, this is easy. We can fix this. So it was a super fun part of, of um, uh, making this swap file uh, support work. So now, um, writing to the EBS volumes needed to speed up. So there was originally um, a, uh, a patch that was uh, submitted upstream, but then not accepted to create a, uh, a, a queue, actually to aggregate the, the, uh, the improvement that was, that was submitted was a loop that would aggregate rights into 256k chunks, and then that would push. Uh, that was the right size for an EBS volume um, for the root FS in the standard way that it was deployed uh, for us to get the results, the faster results that we wanted. But it turned out that you know nobody felt like that was the right way to do it. Um, and uh, working with this engineer at uh, Amazon, Xiao Yi, Xiao Yi was very interested in trying to figure out what, determine what the right way to do that with. It was and so instead of just trying to go out and figure it out on his own um, we got connected with a couple of people again on the uh, on the uh, kernel kernel engineering side from from Red Hat and started to work back and forth about how this worked and one of the things that I really loved about this is kind of it's it's uh, it's a kind of hard to see but in the, in that um, in that little sign off the the email header that I've got in the middle, there's a place where um, where uh, Rafael Wasaki uh, makes a small modification. He edits the white space and uh, and fixes some of the issues that Xiao Yi had in in the original submission, which I thought was super exciting because um, because Xiao Yi uh, had never had anything accepted to the kernel before, and this was his first commit. And the way that he was treated by the community as a result of that collaboration was impressive. And I really love seeing that work uh, go on and, and see how uh, he was um, really just generally accepted uh, as a collaborator. And then as, as a junior developer, uh, a, you know, in junior in the sense that he's working with these, these guys from, who have been longstanding working on file system issues um he was he was just taken into the fold so it's a great story for me in terms of of just being a, of the inclusive nature of the community there so <clears throat> the next thing uh we wanted to tackle that that really sort of cinched up the the file the swap file support and so once we looked back on that we looked we, you know started to look at it and say okay i think we have everything in place uh, that we can move forward with the enterprise distribution now. Now we're kind of now we're coming back and we're starting to separate out the the um, the uh, components that are uh, the responsibility of of the individual um, groups. Right, the operating system support is complete. Now we'll focus back on uh, what we're trying to contribute into that into that. Uh, experience and so yeah that starts with getting upstream support right so we figured out what we needed to do um so first off more than a year ago we started off with the patches that were in place from the um from the original uh, attempt to support uh, ec2 hibernate on spot and remember spot is significantly different in the sense that there's metadata to be uh, to be monitored so that you can find out that you have a two-minute warning 
in place to that's going to enforce a shutdown because the cost of the instance has exceeded the cost that you have um, the allowed cost in your configuration. And so once you have that information from the two minute warning, you can start to make uh, changes as you see fit. And then um, <clears throat> uh, support for that required some modifications to the kernel that we didn't find to be um, easy for any, you know, to, to get upstream. So um, the, uh, so, so we dropped that one and then came back to it this year and started, started working on this. And with the help of, uh, Carl George and, and Neil Gompa, who, who helped, who did the package review, um, we got everything set up in the upstream to make it possible for this to be, uh, fully supported, um, in the Fedora space and then, well, not fully support, I'm sorry, supported in the, in the sense that it builds and, uh, and is included in the, um, in the distribution. So now it's accessible in an easy way from Fedora on, on, uh, um, on the EC2 instances that are running Fedora. Fast forward, um, we want, you know, now we're running that into, uh, into the Apple eight, and uh, this gives us the support that we need in um, in the uh, uh, in the CentOS 8 stream. Why do we want the CentOS 8 stream? It's because uh, as those changes roll out for um, for the Hibernate agent, they're rolling into you know they've been rolling into um, the this subsequent um, minor releases which means that we're uh, we're still working off of things that need that have been tested they're validated right they've they've been worked on uh, they've been uh, reviewed they've been made part of the uh, the QA and for for rail but now we need those in a place where we can get to them and test them and make sure that they're ready for everyone else to use um, and uh, this is where that's happening right so we're now we're in Apple 8 that was a great, for me, that was a great, um, uh, that was a big, huge win and something that we could do because we knew that we could get the support we needed for um, for the standard instances without having to worry about looking back and getting support for spot instances at the same time. So now all the mechanics that are required around the Zen instances, because there's no, uh, there's no ACPI power management in the same way on, 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 uh, some of the Zen instances we have. There's no requirements to go back and read the EC2 metadata. We're just using uh, the regular ACPI calls that are coming out of the standard Nitro uh, configuration that we have on our uh, current generation instance types. And that's what this looks like, right? So the host architectures that we have um, have some, some minor limitations, especially in the Zen based stuff. And so when we're looking at how we were going to support the the um, uh, the Red Hat community, the Fedora community, we had to take into account that there were some things that were not going to be a part of um, the kernel that because because they were not upstream. Um, so uh, it was important to remember that you know because we don't have the power management changes in the kernel. Uh, we don't have access to the Zen based configuration requirements that we have. And that effectively looked like um, within the, you know, within the, the, the EC2 domain, that looks like a, like a, a button press. So, uh, so we focused in on uh, that standard instance, the KVM based hypervisor uh, configuration and the bare metal system. So now you can use, hibernate on uh, the uh, standard nitro based instances like a T3 or the C5 or the M5, but the earlier generations that are based on SIN, um, uh, so early M3s, M2s, things like that, we, we, we separated the, that support out so that we could have uh, a clear path for uh, ensuring that we could, we could do some, uh, we could do full support. 
So <clears throat> uh, that made it possible for us to do templated deployments, right? So now I can I can push out the EC2 Hibernate uh, support to the instance, and then I can also from uh, right now from Apple testing. Uh, but after this, everybody will be able to test, and I'll get more karma, right? Um, the uh, after Apple testing, uh, we'll we'll have or or using Apple testing today, you can uh, install the EC2 Hibernate agent and uh, start the Hibernate service for uh, for an instance, and you can set up the instance to take that in a CloudFormation template in uh, what we call an EC2 launch template. Launch templates let you make some very dynamic uh, decisions around what instances you are deploying for a fleet. And if some of those instances are not available, you can substitute other instance types and it becomes a very uh, uh, fluid um, way of getting the compute power you need. Uh, you can do API launches from different uh, software development kits in, in Go, in Python, uh, uh, through the AWS CLI and, and the Boda Core, uh, you can do that. And that's also included in Apple. So if you're using Apple 8, uh, you have access to the V1 of the AWS CLI. Uh, V2 is pending. And uh, Terraform, you can do it. Um, oh, this is test account, but that's not what it means. I'll have to change that. So uh, Red Hat Ansible. So the Ansible uh, does not yet support Hibernate. Uh, we're working on that. Stay tuned for more. So, um, so here's the Hibernate agent, and uh, one of the things that Hibernate agent doesn't have upstream that uh, working on making a part of that is uh, is a test case uh, that, that we can then push into um, uh, uh, push into the functional tests for later. But right now. Um, and QA test for Fedora. Uh, right now, I'm uh, really focused in on just having a minimum viable uh, test case. And uh, so that's uh, over the last few days, that's that's where this has gone. But this turns in, out to be the easiest way to move forward. So if you're using a launch template or you're using an EC2 cloud formation template today or any other, uh, any other method of, of um, activating the run instances call, uh, the API call uh, for for building out instances, you can stand up any number of instances uh, with the same configuration. And uh, so inside of this um, this YAML file that I've used to to define this cloud formation template, uh, I have some some specific parameters that are important for enabling hibernation in the hibernation options. Uh, for a CentOS stream instance. So obviously you can go to the wiki uh, for CentOS and you can find the um, uh, the released machine images. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Fabian. Um, and, uh, and then you can set that image ID in this, uh, in your um, CloudFormation template. There's a lot of ways to do this. There's um, a whole lot of dynamic stuff to do around uh, CloudFormation templates to get them to do things for multiple uh, multiple regions and to to make you know to help uh, make decisions based on uh, dynamic rules. Uh, but but all of that has been tabled so that I can show you what it is that's being modified here. Um, so the root root file system has to be larger than uh, the standard file system. And the way that we we do that is by increasing the volume size. You could do this dynamically based on the amount of memory uh, that's associated with any specific instance type. But I think it's, you know, in my case, I just set it uh, higher than 16 gig and knowing that I'm not going to use an instance type that is has a, a larger memory footprint than, uh, you know, than about 32 gig. Usually I'm I'm uh, leaving it right there. So. Uh, so to use it, also, you have to have an encrypted volume. Um, it makes sense to encrypt volumes anyway. I mean, having things encrypted at rest makes uh, good sense. And uh, because there's, you know, no additional cost for encrypting a volume, it just seems reasonable that you would want to have uh, your data encrypted 
when you're not using it so that nobody else can. Um, <clears throat> the uh, CloudFormation template uh, execution happens on the API layer. And so I've just, I've just done this uh, in the context of just showing you here in the context of the AWS CLI, how you would go about standing up an instance uh, from that CloudFormation template. So um, once the CloudFormation template is defined, um, I, use, I have a cloud config that I use to, um, to set up the internals of the instances themselves. And uh, that gives you the ability to um, define things like my default user. So a lot of times, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want my default user to be, um, to be CentOS. I want it to be, uh, you know, dab dunk or something like that, or test or certification or builder or whatever. And, and, uh, and I want that to be where I'm doing specific types of work and, and have scripts that are expecting to be uh, leveraged in the context of those users. So, um, so I pass that in on the CloudFormation template as user data and then do a deploy. Uh, so in this case, uh, I'm doing a deployment from, the, from my test directory. I'm giving my stack a name of uh, CentOS Stream 8 test and I'm launching it into a specific bucket in my account so that I know where my templates are. And once I'm completed, once I've completed all of this, I can delete, destroy all the artifacts that are associated, or I know exactly where those artifacts are so that I can associate them with my, my test run. Um, so now I can describe the stack events to determine whether or not uh, everything went as I expected it to, whether or not the, the create happened the way that I wanted it to. And then I can move on to uh, looking for, in this case, the third, my third and final uh, um, command here that starts with AWS is the describe instances call with a filter that looks for uh, instances that were initiated that have the hibernation uh, configuration option set to true. So the testing happens by, uh, usually what I do with my testing is I initiate the hibernation. Well, so I start a, uh, create a results file um, by just, just uh, um, sending all of the current um, process IDs to a file. And then I hibernate the instance and then bring the instance back up uh, once it's stopped, once it's in a full stop state and then verify that those uh, those process IDs have not changed for, for the um, most of the, um, the, the processes, right? Um, so uh, once, I've, once I have a, a, a good idea that this is the same environment that I shut down, um, then I provide that uh, then I will delete the entire stack. So clean everything up. And this is something that, you know, if you're, this is a great practice if you're uh, working with your, with configuring. Your stack and make that available um, to, um, uh, for the, for the, um, for the duration. And then when you're ready, when you're ready to roll back, roll that back and uh, try to, you know, our goal is to try and make that a, uh, an opportunity for a zero dollar um, result. So if I'm, if I push that out, I can, and I can do that in the context of Ansible, right? All of this works uh, through the CloudFormation um, modules for, for Ansible. Uh, if you're, if you want to do this in the, you know, in, in a, an appropriate infrastructure model. Um, then, then when you need to, you can just roll it back and, and the effort you should put into that is trying to make sure that you're not leaving behind artifacts um, from, the, from the deployment. And that brings me pretty much to the end of the talk. Um, if there are questions, I don't see, uh, I don't see a lot of questions here. 
Um, but if there's interest or uh, information that you want to understand better about this, I would certainly love to chat about it. Uh, we don't have to do it in this context. All right. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask at this point? Well, thank you very much, David. Thank you for this presentation and uh, thank you for your time. Yeah. Um, and, and thank you for everybody that has attended. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is our last session of today. We will start again tomorrow at 1400 UTC. Um, Meanwhile, if you would like to continue to hang out and ask questions, I encourage you to go over to the hallway track where there have been a number of people there all day um, chatting, some technical, some social. And uh, that will remain open all night long, although I'm not gonna hang out there all night, but I will be there on and off and again tomorrow morning. So again, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow.